Hi, welcome back to The Wandering Wesleyan. I'm Chaplain Greg and our Walking in the Word series and we're going to continue today with our look at the Torah. We have finished up Genesis. We spent a lot of time in Genesis with the first three chapters in depth and uh, looking at the rest of the book, but now we're heading into the next book of the Torah and that is Exodus. And uh, like we mentioned in an earlier video, Exodus is a Greek name. It's not a Hebrew name. The Hebrew name for Exodus is Shemot, and Shemot means names. That's weird. Until you look at Exodus 1.1, where it says, These are the names of the sons of Israel who came to Egypt with Jacob. Each came with his family. So this is important. This is the names of the people that settled in the Goshen area of Egypt. And uh, Jacob and uh, Joseph and all the brothers eventually pass away. And Exodus 1 7 says, But the Israelites were fruitful and increased rapidly, multiplied, and became extremely numerous in the land and was filled with them. So this is, they're, they're fulfilling the commandment of the blessing of the garden, be fruitful and multiply. They are doing that. They are filling this region of Goshen with many, many more people. So we're going to jump ahead 400 years, 400 years. And 400 years later, the Israelites are huge. There's a whole bunch of them, but guess what? There's a new Pharaoh. There's a new king of Egypt in charge, and he doesn't remember what Joseph did. He doesn't remember uh, the promises that were made to the people uh, who came down from the land of Canaan and settled in Egypt. And he, this Pharaoh becomes kind of a snaky figure. Now, we don't know if this Pharaoh early in, in Moses' childhood is the same Pharaoh as uh, Moses would later face when he brought the children of Israel out of Egypt. But Pharaoh turns into a very dark and evil figure. He's a Satan figure, and he enslaves the nation of Israel. They have a fear that if Egypt were to go to war with somebody, uh, that Israel would rise up against Egypt, and there were too many of them. So they enslaved them and, and involved them with many, many building projects. So out of this out of the tribe of Levi. Remember all our tribes. <clears throat> now, Judah is the one that was promised that the scepter, the line of Judah, was promised that uh, the kingship would run through them, but we're not there yet. So the tribe of Levi becomes important. Out of the tribe of Levi, we have this fellow who we just mentioned, Moses. Moses is a fellow who survives the uh, killing of all the uh, infant children by Pharaoh. Pharaoh kills all uh, boys, uh, Israelite boys, two years old and under. But Moses survives because, as the famous story goes, his mom puts him in a basket, sticks him in the river, kind of an ark scenario there. Uh, puts him in the river, Pharaoh's daughter finds him, raises him as an Egyptian. So Moses is in an odd spot because he's over eight days old and circumcision has happened. It's pretty obvious, and I'll let you figure that out what that means. It's pretty obvious that Moses is a Hebrew. He's not an Egyptian, but he's raised in an Egyptian household. So on the one hand, we have this enslaved group of people he identifies with, but also this very... Uh, kingly and uh, privileged position that he's in. Moses sees uh, an Egyptian uh, beating another of his kinsmen, a Hebrew, and he kills the Egyptian. So not only is he kind of mixed up in his ethnicity, now he's a murderer. And he leaves Egypt because he's wanted for murder and he goes all the way to this place called Midian which is uh, hundreds of miles away um, towards the east and um, he becomes a shepherd now going from almost a prince in a palace to a shepherd 
is a big fall. But he settles in Midian. He becomes a shepherd. He gets married. And while he's out shepherding, in chapter 3, we have the very famous scene of the burning bush, where God comes to him as the angel of the Lord or the Spirit of God. God comes to him and speaks to him and says to him, guess what? You're the guy. You're the guy that's going to go and deliver my people and bring them back to the land that I promised them. Problem is, Moses doesn't want to do it. And the first thing he asks him, well, who should I say? Who are you? Who are you, God? Remember, Moses is surrounded by all of these gods. The God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob is, is largely a thing of the past. He's surrounded by all these different gods, the gods of Midian, the gods of Egypt. Well, what kind of God are you? This is an amazing thing. I'm seeing a bush that's burning, but it isn't being consumed. You're talking to me out of the fire. You must be some significant God. Who are you? And what does God say his name is? He says, eh -heh. Eh -heh. In Hebrew, eh -heh means I am. What a strange name for a God. I am who I am. Eh -heh, I am who I am. And this is in... Uh, chapter 3 so let's go to chapter 3 and we're going to go to verse 13 we're going to start at 13 then Moses asked if I go to the Israelites and say to them this is the God of your ancestors has sent me remember it's the God of your ancestors it's not your God right now God of your ancestors and they asked me what is his name what should I tell them God replied to Moses I am who I am this is what you are to say to the Israelites I am has sent you God also said to Moses, say this to the Israelites, the Lord, and if you're reading along, you'll see that Lord is all capitalized. So that means it's Yahweh. Where do we get Yahweh from? Well, I am, eh is kind of awkward to say. So the name of the Lord in Hebrew is Yahweh, which means he is. All right? So wherever you see Lord capitalized, L-O-R-D, it's referring to that holy name of Yahweh. He is. And the rest of the Hebrew scriptures uses this name for God, Yahweh. And if you have a more uh, Hebrew-based Bible, like the Complete Jewish Study Bible or uh, the Tree of Life Bible, then you'll see that it was, I, th I think it's Yahweh, I can't remember, but there are some translations that will use Yahweh, others more traditionally use capitalized Lord. So Moses does as God says, and he goes back to Egypt. He meets up with his brother Aaron. Remember, they're from the tribe of Levi. Keep that in the back of your mind, because this is important. And Egypt goes through 10 plagues. Why do they go through these 10 plagues? Pharaoh had every opportunity to do the right thing. Does that sound familiar? Sometimes we have every opportunity to do the right thing, but yet Pharaoh decided not to do the right thing. And sometimes we decide not to do the right thing. Pharaoh had the opportunity to let Israel go back to Canaan, but he chose not to. There were 10 plagues. Each of these 10 plagues represent the result of sin it's a it's a decreative kind of process remember creation um, builds up it expands it sustains all of these plagues decreate destruction and and uh, and, and plagues and 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 death happen It's an overpowering of the Egyptian gods. So the Egyptian gods are all represented through these plagues, and they're all being destroyed by the one true God. And the last plague, and this is the important one, the last plague is the plague of death. And this is the ultimate decreative event. The blood of the lamb, okay, 
What does that mean? The blood of the lamb. So God tells Moses that he is to have the people of Israel perform this certain ritual in which a lamb is slain and it is eaten and it's done a certain way. And he spends three chapters in Exodus speaking specifically on how this is done. So the lamb is slain and the blood is put over the mantle. You get that? The blood is over the household. The blood of the lamb is over the household. And if the blood of the lamb is found, and they've done it in the way Moses, God commanded Moses to tell the people, if they've done it that way, then the plague of death is going to pass over, pass over that house, and the firstborn male of the male, men of those house won't die. Needless to say, most, if not all, of the Egyptians don't do this ritual. And almost every single household in Egypt suffers death. The death of the firstborn. Are you hearing all of these themes? These are New Testament themes. The death of the firstborn. The blood of the lamb. All of this is New Testament themes. We come to the New Testament... We're going to be remembering all of this. So death passed over the Hebrew people who performed this ritual. Pharaoh decides at that point to let Israel go. And Israel is released into the wilderness. Israel gets a little far and gets to the Red Sea. But Pharaoh changes his mind and goes after them. So he's going after them. They get to the Red Sea and they're stuck between a sea and a hard place. And what we have is one of the most amazing miracles in all of Scripture. And Moses asks God, What are we going to do? And God says, Put out your staff, part the Red Sea. This is an event that kind of resembles baptism. Okay? The people of it, those sea parts, and the people go down into the water, in between the waters, and they go down in enslaved people, and they come up on the other side, a nation, a new people. Why? Because Pharaoh chases them into the waters, the whole army goes in there, and the waters cover them up and destroy the army of Egypt. Here's Moses, who we learn in scripture is a stutterer, is a murderer, is a um, shepherd, a lowly person, going up the greatest, going up against the greatest military and political power in the entire known world at that time, saying that my God is going to deliver his people and Pharaoh's entire army is destroyed. The children of Israel go down into the waters, one people, and come up out of the waters, a completely different people, a freed people. This is a decreative act, the destruction of this army. And the flood and the sea closes and destroys the Egyptian army, and we saw this in the flood, where God destroys evil through water. God promised he would never flood the earth again, but he used water to destroy the Egyptian army. Things move ahead, and the, the nation of Israel comes to this place. They don't immediately go to Canaan. They go to this place called Mount Sinai. And they run into some problems. Now, I showed you a picture of what the desert looks like. There's nothing there. There's, there's no water. There's no food. There's little scraggly lizards here and there, but that's about it. Maybe a few muskrats here and there. You know, little mammal rodent beasts. So God provides the people with water from a rock. 
Moses bangs it with a staff, out comes water. He also provides this interesting food. Now, the people are saying, we're hungry. We want something to eat. Obviously, there's hundreds of thousands of people. They got to get fed. And God feeds them the bread of heaven. And what is this bread of heaven called? Well, in the Hebrew language, they don't have punctuation marks like we have. We have question marks, we have commas, we have quotation marks, we have exclamation points. But in Hebrew, they don't have that. What they have is sounds. So if you're asking a question, you would finish your sentence with ma. You would say, the, you would say your sentence the ma. And that would indicate this is a question. If you're excited and you want to make what we would consider an exclamation point, you'd say, nah. So what is this? This bread from heaven. It's ma, nah. What is this? If you're going to spell mana or mana, this bread from heaven, it's a question mark and an exclamation point. Ma, nah. What is this? This bread from heaven that comes down and feeds us. God feeds his people. He takes care of his people. So while they're at Mount Sinai, Moses goes up. And he receives ten commandments. And these are not suggestions. These are commandments. And as you're reading through the ten commandments, and this is in Exodus 20. We've gone all the way up through Exodus 20. We're going a little bit faster now. But Exodus 20 gives us the Ten Commandments. And as you read the first four commandments, they have something in common. They all have to do with man's or humanity's relationship with God. You have no other gods before me. No idols. You are not to take my name in vain. And you're to keep the Sabbath and keep it holy. The first four commandments. Man's... Humanity's relationship with Yahweh. Now, commands 5 through 10 is how humanity gets along with itself. Don't steal, don't murder, you know, don't lie, don't commit adultery. All of these things, honor your father and mother, all of these things have to do with humanity getting along with itself. Now, there's a whole bunch of other laws that are given, laws about idolatry, um, how to treat slaves. All right, stop here for a second. We get all uptight when we hear that word slave. Uh, slavery has been around since the, dawn, since the fall. Uh, since Lemech enslaved his two wives. Really, that's what he did. Um, slavery has been around. Slavery is a horrible, awful thing. And we, in 21st century Western thinking, have come to realize and have that a part of our DNA that slavery is horrible. But slavery in the ancient world was common. It would be unthinkable to say slavery is wrong and we should get rid of it. But God works within human culture. God works within human economics. And so when God is giving Moses these commands about slavery, he is starting to elevate the slave not as property, but as people. When we get to the New Testament and Paul talks about slavery, he's saying that slaves... If you're a Christian, if you're a follower of Jesus, and your slave is a follower of Jesus, guess what? You're equals. And in fact, if we're going to follow Jesus' commands, where the first shall be last and the last shall be first, the slave is actually greater than the master. All of this is part of God's plan. And see, the idea that slavery is evil and awful wouldn't have come about were it not for God, were it not for the Ten Commandments, were it not for the Christian ethic. 
So there's laws about slaves. There's also some personal injury law and laws on theft. And Moses brings these laws down, crop protection, personal property, uh, laws protecting the most vulnerable people in the community. That's, that's important. For the laws respecting God's Sabbath and festivals. When he comes down, chapter 24, they have this big ceremony and all the people agree that we're going to abide by these laws, by these Ten Commandments. Wonderful. Now, most of our thinking about Moses coming down with the Ten Commandments comes from Charlton Heston bringing two big tabs, singing, seeing something going on and breaking those tabs. That's not what happened. Reading scripture, Moses came down. The people had an agreement. They were going to follow these commands. Well, what happens? That's for next week. So, Thank you for joining me today with the Wandering Wesleyan and our Walking in the Word, looking at the Torah and Exodus. If you like this channel, please uh, like and subscribe and uh, share it. Love for you to share it with other people who might be interested in this kind of content. Until then, be blessed. Take care.